welcome to On This Day in Tudor History with me, Claire Ridgway, author of several Tudor history books. Now, where am I taking you back to today? Well, I'm taking you back to the reign of King Henry VIII. But on this day in Tudor history, the 1st of November, 1527, the Feast of All Saints, William Brooke, 10th Baron Cobham, courtier and diplomat, was born. Cobham was a close friend of William Cecil, Baron Burley, and Elizabeth I's chief advisor. So Cobham became very powerful in Elizabeth's reign. He served as Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports, Privy Councillor and Lord Chamberlain, and was able to escape charges of treason twice, thanks to his friends and patrons. Let me tell you a bit more about this lucky Tudor man. William was born in 1527, and he was the eldest surviving son of George Brooke, 9th Baron Cobham, and his wife Anne Bray. Although William was officially enrolled at Queen's College, Cambridge in the early 1540s, it appears that he was in Padua and Venice, where he was supposed to be studying civil law, although, as his biographer Julian Locke points out, he was licensed to carry arms, and so might have been more interested in being a soldier. When William was just eight years old, he was contracted to marry Dorothy Neville, daughter of George Neville, third Baron Abergavenny, and the couple married in 1545. The marriage was not a happy one, but they had a daughter, Frances, together before separating in around 1553. Dorothy died in 1559. In the late 1540s, William was serving as a soldier at the garrisons in Boulogne, then Calais, and he was knighted in December 1548. In 1549, he had his first experience of diplomacy, accompanying Sir William Paget on an embassy to Brussels. William served King Edward VI as an esquire of the body, and in 1550, the leader of Edward's government, John Dudley, Duke of Northumberland, appointed William to the Privy Council. In 1551, he accompanied William Parr, Marquess of Northampton, who was married to his sister Elizabeth, on an embassy to France. In 1553, William was able to avoid being caught up in the Lady Jane Grey succession crisis by abandoning Northumberland but he was sympathetic to the rebel cause in the early 1554 Wyatt's Rebellion against Mary I. His father's home, Cooling Castle, was besieged by the rebels in January 1554, and William's father, who was Wyatt's uncle, claimed he had fought valiantly against the rebels for seven hours before surrendering to them. However, his resistance is more likely to have been a pretense and he and his sons joined the rebels willingly. William and his brother George were able to escape being tried as traitors thanks to the intervention of William's brother-in-law, Henry Neville, sixth Baron Bergevany. Phew. William's father died in September 1558, and William inherited the title of Baron Cobham. Then, in November 1558, Elizabeth I came to the throne, and William was made a special ambassador for the mission of taking the news of Mary I's death to her husband, Philip II of Spain. In December 1558, thanks to his friendship with William Cecil, William was made Lord Warden of the Cinque Ports and Constable of Dover Castle. Then in 1559, he was made Lord Lieutenant and Vice Admiral of Kent. He also served as a Justice of the Peace for the county. In 1560, William married Frances Newton, daughter of Sir John Newton and Margaret Points, and a woman who was serving Elizabeth I in her privy chamber. This marriage was a happy one, and the couple went on to have seven children together, four sons and three daughters. In 1571, William seized letters from Roberto de Rodolfi, who was known for the Rodolfi plot against Elizabeth I. But, according to William, his brother Thomas persuaded him not to turn them over to the Privy Council for fear that he and their friend, the Duke of Norfolk, would get into trouble. The fact that William didn't get into big trouble suggests either that he was actually acting under instructions from William Cecil, Baron Burley, and letting the plot play out, 
or that Burley realised that William wasn't involved in the plot in any way. William's punishment was seven months of house arrest in the custody of Burley. In 1578, he was back working for the government, accompanying Sir Francis Walsingham on an embassy to the Netherlands. Although William was friends with Catholics like the Duke of Norfolk and the Earl of Arundel, and his wife Frances was a Catholic, Calvinist works were dedicated to him and his chaplain was Protestant. He was also given the job of helping John Whitgift, Archbishop of Canterbury, to investigate the Mar Tracts in 1588. In 1585, William was installed as a Knight of the Garter and by early 1586, he was serving on Elizabeth I's Privy Council. In 1588, he wasn't involved in the Spanish Armada in his office at Dover because he was on a diplomatic mission to the Duke of Parma. In 1589, his daughter Elizabeth married Robert Cecil, bringing William even closer to the Cecil family. In 1592, William's wife Frances died at their home Cobham Hall. In 1596, William was made Lord Chamberlain following the death of Baron Hunsdon. But in the winter of 1596-1597, his health began to suffer. He died on the 6th of March 1597, just over a month after his daughter Elizabeth, and he was buried at St Mary Magdalene Church in Cobham. In his will, he left money for the dissolved Cobham Chantry to become Cobham College Almshouse. His eldest son, Maximilian, had died in 1583, so his second son, Henry, inherited his title, becoming 11th Baron Cobham. It's amazing how William kept favour and kept his head, and he really benefited from having friends like the Sissels in high places. Hello, Madge. Tomorrow, I'm going to be talking about a king who only reigned for two months and whose fate is, well, quite a mystery. Do make sure you've subscribed to my channel. You can click around about there and that you've hit the bell so that you don't miss out on that talk. Also on this day in Tudor history, the 1st of November, 1456, Edmund Tudor, first Earl of Richmond and father of King Henry VII, died from the plague at Carmarthen Castle in Wales. Edmund never knew his son because he died while his wife, Lady Margaret Beaufort, was pregnant. You can find out more about Edmund and how he ended up dying at Carmarthen in last year's video. You'll find a link to that in the description. Thank you for joining me today. You can, of course, give me a like and leave me a comment. I'll be back very soon. Take care. Bye-bye.